Hey everybody, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. You know, I couldn't tell you why I decided to go with this particular show this week. You know, it is the 20th anniversary of the show later in the year. I am kind of jumping the anniversary by several months. You know, I don't know, just kind of looking at the list of nominees, looking at the list of nominations for the classic review segment, I'm like, you know what, this one just speaks to me. And it makes sense because I have reviewed the previous two pay-per-views before this one. I reviewed Fully Loaded, I reviewed Summer Slam, and now I'm going to review Unforgiven 1999 from September 26th at the Charlotte Coliseum in Charlotte North, Kakalaki, classic NWA, WCW, Jim Crockett Promotions territory. And so the World Wrestling Federation is running here once again. This show is nominated by Glenn Matchett over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret. This pay-per-view is notable for a few things in regards to the booking. A lot of moments and matches that will go down more than likely in wrestling infamy and speaking of booking this is the final pay-per-view that Vince Russo worked on as the head writer of the WWF before he and Ed Ferreira split for WCW less than two weeks after this we'll talk about that a little more at the end of this review but let's see what kind of blaze of glory Vince Russo goes out on 15,779 people are in attendance here at the Charlotte Coliseum not a full sellout but damn near close 330,000 pay-per-view buys for this show which is up from the previous year by a little bit but then it jumps way up in 2000 to just over 605,000. JR and The King are on commentary again tonight. And uh, man, they're laying it on thick with this opening hype package. This is like peak era of like the, the promo packages during this time. We're like bordering on like the biblical references and like the apocalyptic stuff. Laying it on super thick here. A warrior must be sworn into a battle without mercy. Fueled by the pursuit of the coveted grail. Have mercy on our souls. And one of the big stories going on right now in the World Wrestling Federation, at least in terms of kayfabe, is that the referees are on strike. They have cited unsafe working conditions. They're tired of getting beat up, tired of the ref bumps, so they are picketing outside arenas all across the country. And so one of the big ongoing things right now is that there are scab officials, they're those who have crossed the picket line and just kind of like you know, replacement referees from the back who are putting on the referee shirt and doing their best. They're, they're trying their hardest, people. But yeah, the, the officiating is an ongoing issue uh, in the storytelling with the WWF around this time, and it really reaches its uh, culmination here. Opening matchup is Val Venus versus Steve Blackman, and not only did Val recently cost Lethal Weapon a shot at the European Championship a few weeks ago, he also went ahead and stole Steve's bag of goodies, his bag of weapons, and since then, since he stole the bag, he has been putting his own special toys in the bag, so to speak, and, and King is just giddy over the bag of toys. He tells JR that maybe you could use some of these toys, JR, and the only five Vibrate, haha! <laughs> like he is like one step away from just saying like dildos, Jr. Your scab referee for this matchup is Steve Lombardi, better known as the Brooklyn Brawler. Action kicks off quickly. Blackman works on Val's junk early on, pretty frequently. It's kind of like his weak point, you know. In video games, there's the flashing red part of the body that you work on. That's the weak spot. I'm pretty sure that's Val Venus's weak spot here. They brawl on the outside. Blackman keeps working over Val. Valboski makes his comeback. The knees into the Russian leg sweep. I always found that sequence, the two knees off the ropes into the Russian leg sweep, was really kind of cool sequence for me. I actually used that once or twice uh, in training when I wrestled, but never actually pulled it off in an actual match. Blackman with a spine buster into a bridging pin. Not sure if Val really kicks out of it. He does get his arms up, though. Val hits a bulldog, a DDT, and the money shot for the win. It's a pretty vanilla match, all told. I give it one star out of four. You know, it, it's a competent match. It's a nothing is botched, but kind of boring, and it's, it's not the best match you would have for, like, opening a pay-per-view. After the match, Val reaches into the weapons bag, grabs a kendo stick. Blackman fights back and clocks him with the stick right dead center. Val's knocked out and the EMTs make their way to the ring. Blackman gets into the face of this female EMT who's been showing up pretty regularly at this point. Uh, head of security Jim Dodson intervenes. Blackman shoves Jim who fights back. Blackman walks away. They spend a fair amount of time, a few weeks at least, uh, building this conflict between Blackman and head of security Jim Dodson. I was actually really kind of curious and interested in seeing these two
to having a match. Like, I believe like that was where they were planning on going with this because Dodson apparently did want to train to wrestle, but it never really worked out. He didn't have the ability for it. So they kiboshed this angle pretty quickly. So it is disappointing they built up to it and no resolution was ever really found for it. Like, to me, that was one of my biggest unanswered questions watching at that time period. Like, when's Jim Dodson going to have a match? And of course, that female EMT would be given a name eventually. She turned out to be Barbara Bush, a.k.a. BB. She spent a fair amount of time, like, from here on out until, like, you know, early, mid-2000, uh, working a lot of bikini contests and stuff. Basically, she was there for eye candy. Didn't wrestle uh, at all, really, but she was bafflingly still put in a couple of women's championship matches throughout her run in the World Wrestling Federation. But, yeah, she did not last very long in the company, all told, but this was her entry point. This was the way she was introduced into the company, was as like, the recurring EMT. Backstage, Michael Cole is with the Big Show. Cole asks, hey, where's The Undertaker? Big Show asks Michael if he's taken any stupid pills lately. He says, Taker's teaching has given him a killer instinct. He calls Cole a monkey and then walks away. Our next match is for the European Championship as Mark Henry defends against D'Lo Brown. And the basic gist of the story is Mark would rather get fat and die of a heart attack than have D'Lo as a friend. The whole story with this is uh, D'Lo and Mark, of course, were friends and partners in the Nation of Domination. And uh, then as they were a tag team, the story was Mark Henry had really high blood pressure. And D'Lo, who had recently cut a lot of weight, was trying to train Mark to get in shape. He was trying to help him with his diet and everything. And Mark was just like, come on, can I get some sauce and butter? What's going on, man? And so D'Lo's really trying. Mark's really not having it. And then at SummerSlam 99, uh, D'Lo is defending the Eurocontinental belts against Jeff Jarrett when Mark Henry intervenes. Swerve, he costs D'Lo the match by hitting him with a guitar. So Jarrett wins both championships and Jarrett awards the European title to Mark Henry as a thank you. It's the second time in one year the European title changes hands on a handoff and not in a proper match. So that is the buildup for this. You know, best friends, no more because Mark would rather eat some steak with some sauce than have D'Lo as a friend. Before the match, Mark's being interviewed backstage by Lillian Garcia, and of course, Mark himself is flanked by two nameless lady friends. He makes a pass at Garcia, who slaps him in the face. And then after his introduction, he gets to the mic and says, I can't defend the title because that slap gave me a brainurism. And that's a word that Jerry Lawler would repeat about 400 times for the rest of the night after hearing that one. So he refuses to defend the championship, but D'Lo comes out anyway, and the action starts off pretty quick where with a bit of a brawl on the ramp. Your scab referee is Dr. Tom Pritchard. He is the head scab, according to JR. And hey, he, he was blue pants before Oliva Bates. Look at those blue pants on Dr. Tom. D'Lo is able to hit a low sidewalk slam on Henry, pulling the big guns out pretty early here. Mark drops D'Lo face first into the turnbuckle and goes to do the running sit down on D'Lo's back in the second rope. Uh, but D'Lo moves. Mark eats shit on the ropes. Probably like the biggest bump he had taken in his career at that point. Big dive to the outside by D'Lo, followed with a big cross body in the ring. Mark with a military press, really working over D'Lo here. He crushed crushes D'Lo in the corner. Henry does a very interesting slam where he's got D'Lo on the second or third turnbuckle and he picks him up and he flips him over backward so D'Lo lands on his face. It almost turns like a burning hammer kind of bump. Uh, D'Lo with a Hurricane Rana out of nowhere and he almost spikes Mark in the process but he gets this big comeback. Henry with the corner punches, he mocks D'Lo's taunt but then D'Lo catches him and hits him with a powerbomb actually, followed by the lowdown. It's a little short but still connects. D'Lo wins and regains the European Championship and the crowd loves it. I'm going to give this one two stars out of four. The match wasn't exactly a barn burner, but the crowd was really hot for it. And I give both guys credit for taking some chances and doing some different things in this match to really kind of set themselves apart. A nice win for D'Lo as well. This would be Mark Henry's only championship in his uh, list of accolades for like a decade or so before he won the ECW championship when that brand was resurrected, you know, several years later. Like Mark was in a total title drought, didn't win nothing after this. So for a while, his only championship like victory was the belt being handed to him. Backstage, the Acolytes cut a promo on their opponents, the Dudley Boys. They say they already ran one ECW tag team out of the company and they're willing to do it again. As their promo's wrapping up, you, see, you hear this scuffle in the back background it goes over to the entryway of the locker room and there's a bunch of wrestlers like beating up this one dude and it's Chaz former headbanger Mosh because the whole thing right now is Chaz is being ostracized because he is being accused of beating up his girlfriend Mariana 
let's back up. The headbangers have been split up. Thrasher was hurt, and so they were trying to test the waters with uh, Mosh in a singles uh, run. So they gave them this beaver cleavage gimmick, really cheesy, and they ran all these uh, vignettes about it, and they were implying that it was kind of an incestual thing, an incestuous gimmick with uh, beaver cleavage and his, his hot mom, essentially. And uh, so he gets one match on TV. The next week, he's cutting a promo, and he stops dead in his tracks. I can't do this. And then one week later, he redebuts as Chaz. Just, he's, he's being himself. He says, I'm a normal guy from Jersey. I'm Chaz. You know, this is my girlfriend, Mariana. And they had a bit of a push, a bit of a run on TV with that. And then after a few weeks of that, all of a sudden, things got really dark because the idea was Mariana was accusing Chaz of hitting her. And so she had like, the black eyes and the bruises and everything. The locker room was not having any of Chaz. Didn't want to be near him because he, he was, a, it was a woman beater and all this stuff. And so eventually, he would be exonerated because at one point, I think it was an episode of Heat, where the cops were getting ready to take Chaz away. But then who shows up on the stage but three? Thrasher, he's back from injury, and he reveals some GTV footage that shows Mariana actually applying makeup to look like she's got a black eye. So she was faking the whole time. She's taken away, and then the headbangers reunite, and this whole nasty chapter is behind us. But yeah, sidebar over. Backstage, Deborah says the first time Jeff Jarrett laid hands on her would be the last. She's no longer wanting to be a part of Jeff Jarrett's business. Jarrett storms in, tells Deborah to stay out of his business, all right, she was already doing that, and takes Miss Kitty with him. Jeff Jarrett defends the Intercontinental Championship against the ninth wonder of the world, China. Uh, China became the number one contender by signing her name on an open challenge contract on Jarrett's locker room door. And the whole thing was she and Billy Gunn were looking at the contract, and Billy's like, I gotta find a pen. He walks off, China signs her own name, very crafty. Those two actually have a match to determine who the actual number one contender will be, and China beats him, so now she is for sure fighting Jarrett. And meanwhile, Jarrett's become a big like, male chauvinist character, like, attacking women and saying all women should be barefoot and pregnant, not wrestling, and certainly not wrestling men. Uh, he beats up Cindy Margolis and Lynn Garcia and Mula and May and beats up a female stagehand. His just war on women is just going totally unchecked. On Go Home Week, though, on SmackDown, China laid Jarrett out took his trunks off and put them on herself to show she's wearing the pants in this feud. In a rare reversal of fortunes, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but we got a rare woke moment from Jerry Lawler here where, you know, JR says in commentary, can you imagine how embarrassed Jeff Jarrett would be if he lost to a woman tonight? And Lawler's like, you're just being a male chauvinist pig. Like, whoa, what, what happened here? Your scab referee for this match is Harvey Whippleman. China with some big hits early on. Jarrett goes for an ax handle, but China counters the big low blow, blatant low blow that goes completely unpunished by the referee recurring theme tonight. Jarrett gives China ring post-itis, a uh, hat tip to Anderson and Gallows that term, to get the cutoff. A big superplex by Jarrett and a single arm takedown from the second turnbuckle. Uh, you see uh, Fabulous Mula and Mae Young are ringside for this match as well. China drops Jarrett off her shoulders, but we get a kick out. Jarrett with a sleeper, China fights out and hits a suplex, followed by a power slam and a power bomb. Uh, Jarrett returns the favor with one of his own. Jarrett goes to the figure four, but China kicks him out of the ring. China hits Jarrett with a chair multiple times. Harvey still does nothing. Back in the ring, China goes to the pedigree, but Jarrett catches her. Slingshots her into the corner, but into the face of Harvey Whippleman. He's dead for a while. Uh, Jarrett has Kitty, Miss, Miss Kitty, I should say, who's been accompanying Jarrett here. Miss Kitty would be the future, the cat. Kitty hands Jarrett the guitar. May and Moolah get in the ring and just start decking Jarrett. They're beating him up. And Lawler says, they're 100 years old! A big double slam by the ladies, and Jarrett counters the double clothesline and the bumps they take is just such a stiff looking bump and Lawler just loses his shit. Body. Uh, he shit cans the old ladies. Deborah arrives as she, she shoves Miss Kitty down at ringside. As Jarrett goes to the figure four, Deborah El Kabongs Jarrett. China makes the cover. Harvey finally gets up, counts the three, and China wins the match. So you think she's the first woman to become the Intercontinental Champion. Uh, Harvey's about to hand the belt to China, but Dr. Tom Pritchard runs in, intercepts the belt. He shows the replay that shows Deborah getting involved. So we get a bit of a dusty finish here where Tom reverses the decision, and so Jarrett 
Jarrett wins by disqualification and he retains the belt. China beats the hell out of Dr. Tom for good measure. I'm going to give this match two and a half stars out of four. It had a lot of exciting moments. Uh, yeah, I think it was easily the match of the night up to this point and one of the more entertaining ones of the whole show. China was, you know, a, a very limited performer at this point, but Jarrett did get a lot of good stuff out of her in this match. This was like a typical like Vince Russo style booking where it's like all this shit gets thrown in at the last minute for the finish. Like you've got, you know, Deborah, you got Mula and May, you've got guitars involved, you have like a referee bump, you've got a reverse fin a reverse decision. There was a lot of stuff going on here, but it told a really good story and it set up nicely for their rematch the following month at Judgment Day, the good housekeeping match. Up next, the Dudley Boys take on the Acolytes. Uh, Bubba and Devon made their debut in the company one month prior, straight from ECW. This is their first real big test. You know, Brad, Jean, and Farouk are kind of the gatekeepers for the Dudley, so to speak. You know, uh, they beat the hell out of Public Enemy earlier in the year and sent them packing. And so the Dudleys came in with a bit of like a reputation they didn't really uh, deserve because, oh, by guilt by association, essentially, because, oh, the Public Enemy had bad attitudes. We ran them out. Are the Dudley boys going to be the same way? So the Dudleys, I think, were really uh, walking on eggshells early on to make sure not to offend anybody. And they were being put up against, you know, these kind of, like I said, the, 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 the gatekeepers of the World Wrestling Federation, Bradshaw and Farouk, two guys who could stiff the hell out of you if they wanted to, and they really wanted to here. Early in the Dudley boys' run in the company, Bubba was still doing a stuttering gimmick that he it was kind of a carried over from their ECW days. It didn't last very long, though. Uh, your referee for this matchup is Jimmy Corderas. He's a referee who actually crossed the picket line. Bubba's hit with a flapjack early on, followed by a huge big boot from Bradshaw. Bubba recovers, hits a senton off the second rope. Bradshaw with a second rope superplex. So the two like tumble to the outside later on. Jerry is just like every once in a while he keeps recalling what happened to Fabulous Moolah and Mae Young in the last match and he just keeps like losing his composure. Bubba and Devon hit a double neckbreaker. Jim Ross calls it the 3D. It is not. Powerbomb into a diving headbutt. Bradshaw somehow kicks out. Bradshaw deadlifts Devon off the top turnbuckle with a big back suplex. Just, just deadlifts him. We get an awkward two count. Suddenly Stevie Richards comes in dressed as an acolyte, uh, complete with not like the weird, mysterious runes or symbols on their chest. He had like the UPN logo on his chest, which I thought was pretty hilarious. He does a Stevie kick to Devon. He gets pinned and the Acolytes win the match. Uh, this of course was during the brief run. Stevie was kind of like, when he first came into the company, his whole shtick was he was like copying other wrestlers gimmicks to try and like fit in or get along. I, I'm trying to remember who else he parodied. I think he might have parodied Chris Jericho once. I know he parodied Dude Love on one occasion, uh, but I can't think of other people besides like Dude Love and the Acolytes that he like was directly ripping off at this point. But after the match, the Acolytes beat the hell out of Stevie and they kind of like shake his dead hand as kind of a thank you for his help. I give this one one and a half stars. I, I, to be honest, I was really hoping for more of what you would call a slobber knocker here. I wanted to see more, you know, bombs being thrown here. We saw a little bit of that, but I think that we would get that later in their program with each other. And that at that point, the Dudleys, I think, would have definitely like passed their test, earned their stripes, what have you. So we get some of that here, but, you know, because when I saw this match on paper, I'm like, oh, goody, I really want to see this match because I want to see, like, how the Dudleys react and everything. But, yeah, it was actually surprisingly tame. Uh, you know, the Dudleys would just do fine for themselves, though, after passing the test in the World Wrestling Federation. We then go right into the next matchup as Ivory defends the Women's Championship against Luna Vachon in a hardcore match. This entirety of this match takes place backstage. It begins when Ivory gets the jump on Luna from behind, and these two are just kind of like hitting each other with everything that's not nailed down, throwing things at each other uh, throughout the whole thing. It's just a big like, ugly brawl, essentially. At one point Luna gets Ivory in this room with like a copy machine, and she like slams her face into the copy. She's just trying to push the button to get it to go, but Luna, you gotta warm that machine up for like at least a minute or two before it starts firing up. Also, JR with the very timely SNL reference. Oh, Luna's making copies! <laughs> making copies! At one point, the camera man even gets taken down. Uh, Ivory tries to pin Luna, but it's too bad her shoulders aren't down. Luna climbs a forklift and dives onto Ivory atop some boxes. We get a two count. They make their way to Tori, who's the last person Ivory fought in a hardcore match. Uh, she runs in to try and attack Ivory, but it backfires. Ivory decks Luna with a pull, pins, and retains the title there. I'm going to give it a half star. Like I said, not much this match. Just a big, ugly brawl. You know, it's like there wasn't much to this matchup. Uh, the, the, the copy machine 
machine spot was funny. Besides that, not much else to it. Then right as that match is over, we get a backstage interview with Mula and May talking about what happened with Jeff Jarrett. Ivory storms in and rubs her victory in Mula's face, and then the two of them beat up Ivory. And uh, this would actually carry over into the following pay-per-view, No Mercy, in October, when Ivory would defend the championship against Mula, and Mula would win. <laughs> she would actually hold the belt for about eight days before going back to Ivory. Well, what do you do when your Billy Gunn and your big singles push as King of the Ring falls flat in its ass while you get back together with Road Dog, of course? Uh, the previous week, actually, the Go Home SmackDown before this pay-per-view, Billy Gunn reunited with the Road Dog, who he himself just came back onto TV after taking several weeks off to sell an injury from his match with Chris Jericho about five weeks beforehand. So they reunited, they fought Rock and Sock Connection for the Tag Team Championships, and they won. So one match back together, and they are Tag Team Champions once again. Hard reset set on the Outlaws because, you know, they both had singles runs and it ended right here. And tonight the Outlaws defend those titles against Edge and Christian who became number one contenders earlier in the month after beating the Acolytes. Billy just bumping his ass off for Edge in the beginning here. Lots of back and forth. Uh, Edge and Christian start working over the Road Dog. Road Dog gets out of the chin lock and we see a big double cross body between he and Christian. It looks like a real hard impact there. Good work by Edge and Christian to keep Road Dog in the ring. Road Dog with a glimmer of hope after hitting a double DDT off the ropes. There's a hot tag. Guns a big house of fire. Edge hits Road Dog with a spear and then suddenly Gangrel and Matt Hardy yank Christian out of the ring. Jeff Hardy with a top rope drop kick to Edge while the referee is distracted. Big famous there to Edge. The Outlaws retain and the New Brood strikes again. We'll be seeing uh, the New Brood, the Hardy Boys, versus Edge and Christian, the original Brood, in that uh, tag team ladder match next month at No Mercy and the rest for them is history. I give it two stars out of four this match. Not a whole lot of heat to this match because this was made official like on the episode of Heat right before the the pay-per-view and it's also odd because it's basically face versus face because Edge and Christian weren't heels yet and uh, the Outlaws having just reunited were a babyface team uh, but you know the match is well done but nothing particularly special and it's now four straight matches with outside interference uh, involved in the finish that's kind of a Russo trademark backstage the British Bulldog and Triple H are questioned about their new relationship Triple H says he's going to do his job Bulldog's going to do his at the end of the night Triple H is walking out the new WWF champion elsewhere back Stage, Michael Cole interviews the big boss man. Does he regret what he did to Pepper? Not a damn bit. This is going to be a night that no one's going to uh, forget. This night's going to be a night nobody's going to uh, forget, especially Al Snow. And finally backstage, Al Snow's being interviewed. He says, for the memory of Pepper, Al's going to beat big boss man's fat donut eating ass. I wonder if boss man's eating those ham steak donuts. And now it's time for the match you've probably all been waiting for here. It's the Kennel from Hell match for the Hardcore Championship as Al Snow defends against the Big Boss Man. It's the Chalupa of wrestling matches. It's a crunchy blue cage wrapped in a flowery hell in a cell, and it's all held together by some refried Rottweiler. I'm starting to lose the analogy here, and I'm getting hungry. Last time we saw these guys, it was in my fully loaded and SummerSlam 99 reviews. Uh, this whole match came about when Boss Man kidnapped Al Snow's pet chihuahua Pepper, cooked him up, and fed him to an unwitting Al Snow in Boss Man's hotel room. And so now this match concept was cooked up by Al himself. It's, you know, the two cages, the cage and the hell in a cell with a pack of, like, bloodthirsty, vicious Rottweilers in between. They're going to tear him limb from limb. How is anyone going to survive this? Well, let's get, not get ahead of ourselves. Let's see how this plays out. Al begins right away with some nightstick shots. Uh, out come the dogs. And, oh, they look so friendly. They're just happy to be there. At this point, I was thinking, you know, Boss Man could just leave the cell right now. He was on the outside. He could just left the cell while the dogs are making their way in. Like, the bell had already rung, so the match was technically already happening. Uh, one of the dogs takes a piss as soon as they walk in the cell. Very good omen for what's about to happen here. JR says, this match will have some bowling shoe tendencies. You know, way to tell it like it is. Al runs off and could make a break for it and win like Boss Man could have, but instead he climbs the inside of the cell wall. Lots of fighting on top of the cage. Not really interesting stuff. We do get a cool superplex off the cage wall inside the ring. The dogs uh, couldn't care less about what's going on in the ring. They were just barking at each other. At one point, they're humping each other. Uh, boss Man clatters snow with a cookie sheet. Al's bleeding. You can hear a pin drop in this arena. Nobody cares about what's going on in this matchup. And it just it just keeps going. It goes on longer than this. Uh, boss Man gets some pliers, tries to escape through the top of the cell, but Snow cuts him off. Boss Man grabs some powder, but Snow kicks it into his face. Al tries to stick Boss Man's hand out for the dogs to bite, but the dogs, just, again, they don't care. They're barking at each other. Uh, boss Man decks Snow right in the head with his shovel, and he handcuffs Snow to the turnbuckle, and Al's trapped for all 
all of like 30 seconds. Al's able to break out of the, the handcuffs and he frees himself. Bossman shaking off the top of the cage and gets crossed on the top rope. Al Snow pulls out head from a bag and uh, the crowd makes the biggest noise of the entire matchup. Down goes Bossman. Uh, Bossman makes his way up the roof, but Al manages to slip out of the cell door and wins. Thank God this match is over. JR with a great call saying, we have just seen the first and maybe the last Kennel from Hell match. No maybes about it, Jim. That match ain't coming back anytime soon. Boss Man like flees for his life, but the dogs are nowhere near him. And like, then like the dogs are running after Boss Man and like one of the trainers like trips and falls on his dog. Uh, that, that's pretty symbolic of the whole damn thing. This is a zero star match of folks. It is just bad on every level. It is boring. It is not fun to watch. The entire crux of this angle and why this match exists in the first place are not working out because the dogs went into business for themselves. They couldn't do spots. And so uh, there, might, there might have been a dog named Spot in that group, but they weren't actually doing any spots. It was just really poor execution. I've said this once before and I'll say it again. I like the idea of like a two structure match. Like they kind of got it right with the Punjabi prison, but even that's not perfect. But I like that idea of like two big structures you got to fight your way through. Maybe not having dogs in between, like something else, it was weapons or something i don't know there's uh, there, there's got to be some way to make that concept work and have it be entertaining but this ain't it chief backstage michael cole interviews mankind about the main event what will mankind do when he has to face off with his partner the rock mankind says he will lay the smackdown on the rock's candy ass but don't tell him he said that in your penultimate match, Chris Jericho takes on X-Pac. Uh, this is Jericho's first pay-per-view match in the company, though he did debut before SummerSlam. He was not booked for a match at that show. He was scheduled to fight Ken Shamrock, who'd been feuding for weeks at this point, but Shamrock got an injury, he was taken off TV, and it turns out never returned. Uh, that was the end of Shamrock's time in the company, which I think is pretty disappointing. I think Shamrock was one of those, like, you know, uh, one of my favorite performers during the Attitude Era, so I was always kind of bummed he never got a proper set. Off. So anyway, X-Pac is Shamrock's replacement, and in a way, it's a pretty big test for Jericho here because the, the story always goes that uh, Sean Waltman, X-Pac, was always kind of like the um, the litmus test. He was always kind of the measuring stick for newcomers in the company, where if you know X-Pac would be paired up with these new wrestlers, and if they had a good match, everything was okay, but if not, usually the performers who didn't do well with X-Pac uh, did not last very long in the company. Jericho is flanked by Mr. Hughes, his short-lived bodyguard. They had to kill some time because the crew is still tearing down the blue cage so Jericho really milks the entrance he cuts a promo he says he's saving the crowd from this boring or brutal pay-per-view he is not entirely wrong your referee for this match is head scab Tom Pritchard a nice little opening sequence here that sees a double kip up X-Pac goes for a Bronco Buster a few times this matchup the first time Jericho slips out of the ring X-Pac goes for an X-Factor but Jericho blocks it he does hit a springboard to the outside though basically stealing Jericho's move uh, Curtis Hughes lays out X-Pac right in front of the referee and Dr. Tom doesn't do much about it. Back in the ring, a missile drop hit by Jericho. At this point, the audience is reacting to something completely unrelated to the match itself because we, see, we hear a lot of cheering and booing that is just completely out of sync with what's going on in the ring. So it looks like it might be some kind of like fight or who knows what's going on. The audience, it's funny because the, the, the announcers are saying, oh, I don't know why they're booing this move or man, the crowd's really rallying behind X-Pac here when it's like nothing to do with the match itself. So good on the announcers for trying to cover for it. X-Pac with some fire, but Jericho cuts him off with a triangle drop kick of his own. Another cheap shot by Mr. Hughes. Whatever the crowd is getting into, this match is not that, which is too bad because it's actually a, a good match. Uh, X-Pac goes to the ropes and takes out Hughes. Big springboard attack on Jericho and there's a kick out. The second Bronco Buster attempt and Jericho with the ultra low blow and the referee still doesn't call it. X-Pac is very resilient, kicking out a lot of Jericho's offense. Jericho ends up in the trio of woe and X-Pac hits an upside down Bronco Buster, which is pretty innovative. Hughes gets in the ring and just takes out Dr. Tom and X-Pac. We finally get a DQ finish. Road Dog runs into the ring and makes a save and he and X-Pac clean house. I give this one two and a half stars. I was disappointed at the DQ finish. Uh, you know, it's like, what the hell? Jericho can't even get a victory on his pay-per-view debut has to end in a bullshit ending. I was a little miffed by that, but be that as it may, it was still a pretty entertaining matchup and probably one of the better ones on the night, if not for the finish. 
Ooh boy, time for our main event of the evening. It's a six-pack challenge for the vacant World Wrestling Federation Championship. You got Triple H, Mankind, The Rock, The Big Show, Kane, and The British Bulldog with special guest enforcer Stone Cold Steve Austin. What a wild and woolly journey we have gone on to get here. In fact, I think the build for this match and the, the journey to get to this match is more interesting than the match itself. Let's begin with SummerSlam. Mankind beat Steve Austin in a triple threat match that also involved Triple H to be become the champion for the third and final time in his career. He would drop the belt one night later on Raw to Triple H, so Triple H with his first world championship. At this point, Austin and Triple H are still fighting. Uh, even at one point in this build, Austin puts Triple H in an ambulance and smashes into him with a semi-truck, very similar to what Hollywood Hogan would do several years later to The Rock, and clearly that one was the more memorable one, because I totally forgot that Austin did this to Triple H in 1999. Triple H is mad with power, he insults Linda McMahon, and that brings out Vince McMahon who at this point has been gone for like for off TV for the last like month and a half because he was banished from the company forever after Steve Austin beat The Undertaker at Fully Loaded in that first blood match. So he comes out here to defend the honor of his wife and then that week on SmackDown they have a match for the championship and Vince gets the hell beat out of him. He's bleeding like a stuck pig. Ultimately, Austin costs Triple H that matchup and Vince wins his own championship. He would relinquish the belt the following Monday on Raw so now the six-pack challenge will be for the vacant championship. And because Austin had Vince banished, he has the power to reinstate him. And so he does so under the agreement that Vince will give him a future championship match down the road. And on that same segment, Vince declares Austin will be the special guest enforcer. He's put in this enforcer role because, you know, he is still far and away the biggest star in the company, but he is running out of time, so to speak, because, you know, he has a, he's working hurt. He got a new injury. And basically, he's just kind of like uh, working as far as he can go. It's not too long before he's written off TV uh, at the Survivor Series for for, to get his neck surgery. So he's just really wrestling very sparingly. He's involved in a lot of brawl stuff, but he's not having a whole lot of actual matches at this point. So he's still being utilized in the main event, just not actually wrestling. Also, The Undertaker is supposed to be involved in this matchup here. I mean, he is literally the poster boy for Unforgiven 99, but he leaves the company for a while. He has a groin injury, so the way he's written off is he just kind of like says no to Vincent Mann and walks off. He's actually kind of dressed in his biker gear, which is, you know, uh, we didn't know at the time, but it was for foreshadowing to his return in 2000. And the British Bulldog, who had recently come back to the company, uh, was put in as a replacement for The Undertaker. And then we go to the SmackDown before the pay-per-view, which is just truly bonkersville, because Triple H went through a night of hell wrestling a series of gimmick matches, and he was told he had to win three out of five of them to stay in the six-pack challenge. So let's break it down. He lost a chokeslam challenge to the Big Show. He won an Inferno match with Kane, lost a casket match against Viscera and Midian, who were proxies for The Undertaker here. He won a Boiler Room Brawl against Mankind, and then the tiebreaker, he beat The Rock in a Brahma Bull Rope match, in which special guest referee, the British Bulldog, turned heel and helped Triple H win. So, all these gimmick matches and a swerve, Vince Russo's getting all his shit in before he leaves. Also, that's just so much adversity for, like, the top heel in the company to go through. That's like a babyface story arc, not something for your top heel to just get his ass kicked in five separate matches. Like, John Cena never had odds this daunting in his prime. A couple of awesome attire notes for this match. Matchup here. First off, a uh, British Bulldog wearing his Union Jack tights here. I believe it was the last time he ever wore those tights in the company before just going to the, the jeans and the boots full time. And of course, you gotta love Kane wearing the inverted red and black colors. My favorite look for him. I think it's his coolest look throughout his career. Austin sits down on commentary. It's pretty entertaining throughout. He's like drinking beer the whole time. It's a six man match, uh, but it's with tags. It's like two men are allowed in at any given time. It's not, it's not like tornado style. So it starts off with The Rock and the British Bulldog. Triple Triple H eventually comes in as Rock's working him over. Kane with a blind tag. Kane's working over Mankind. Mankind with some kicks, but Big Show forcefully tags himself in. Kane with an enziguri and a drop kick on the Big Show. Bulldog's tagged back in. At this point, you know, at this point in his career, he's definitely seen better days. But just watching this match, I was still really impressed to see how quick he moved in certain ways, like hitting the ropes, taking the bumps. Still has some gas left in the tank and is still able to perform at a pretty decent level here. Mankind and Triple H are fighting on the floor as the other four guys just stand on the apron watching. Rock breaks the invisible force field by attacking Triple H, and pretty soon everyone's out there fighting. Mankind with a set-out pile driver on Triple H on the stairs, and adding insult to injury, he has a little bit of a wedgie. 
Back in the ring, Mankind tags in The Rock. He gives Rocky a big thumbs up. The Rock just glares at him. Then all of a sudden, the referees who were striking earlier make their way down the ramp and watch the rest of the action from ringside and yelling at Jimmy Corderas all the while. Austin asks why the referees are on strike, and JR says, well, it's due to unsafe working conditions. And Austin says, what's new? The Rock unloads on the big show and takes him down with a big old clothesline. The Rock and Triple H fight on the outside. Rock grabs Austin's beer and spits it in Hunter's face. Big Show signals for the choke slam, but Kane with a diving clothesline. Bulldog hits the power slam on Kane. Triple H the pedigree on the Bulldog. Mankind with a double arm DDT on The Rock. He picked his spot. He was reluctant to fight his friend up until this point, but then he breaks up the sock. Mandible claw, but The Rock hits the rock bottom. Triple H breaks up the pinfall. Everyone's getting their shit in here. At this point, tags mean nothing. Big Show cleans house. Choke slams Mankind. Corderas goes to the pin, but the referees pull Corderas out of the ring and start beating him up. What a sight. All these referees just like laying into Jimmy Corderas. Austin gets up, beats up the referees, and they all start dropping like flies. Rock plants Triple H the DDT. Austin runs in to make the count, and you get a very close two count. Rock bottom, people's elbow. Big Show pulls Austin out of the ring during the count. Bulldog hits Rock with a chair. Austin hits the Bulldog back with it. Triple H the pedigree on the Rock, and Austin reluctantly counts the three. Triple H is the champion once again. So Vincent Mann went on the belt a, a week or two beforehand, just kind of a red herring, and Triple H is the champion once again. Status quo returns. Austin hands Triple H the belt. Triple H gloats, and he eats a stunner as a result. So I guess the fans go home happy in that respect. Uh, I'm going to give this one two and a half stars. The action didn't really get interesting until this match, until at least the halfway point when guys started fighting on the outside. The tag format made it really kind of clunky and lackluster. I don't know if you could do like a tornado style match with all six guys though, because like that's a lot of action, a lot of moving parts. And I think you need to focus on just the two guys at one time until you reach the crescendo near the end. Uh, you know, I th and also it's like, you know, I think the tags format just allows the guys to breathe a little bit. So I think on the one hand, I don't like the fact that it was tags, but on the other hand, I, I understand why they were given those breathers. The following month, Austin would get his promised title shot against Triple H, but would ultimately lose that one in no mercy. The Rock and the Bulldog also had a singles feud stemming from Unforgiven, and that of course would lead to the dog poop, the dog poop, the dog poop, the dog poop. My final grade for Unforgiven 1999 is a C minus. This show is just a very below average pay-per-view. Like 98-99, the WWF still were trying to find their footing in terms of like quality control for their product. By 2000, they had things figured out for a while, but yeah, still kind of a rocky time period here. The things I liked about this show were, you know, Jarrett versus China, Jericho versus X-Pac except for the finish, and the six-pack challenge, but even those matches weren't like amazing matches. They were like just the best ones out of a show with a lot of average to shitty matches. Like the Kennel from Hell really is just the overwhelming black hole that sucks any enjoyment out of this show for me. But also there is the, uh, the, the bad hardcore match with Ivory and Luna. The Dudley Boys versus the Acolytes didn't really live up to my personal expectations. I think I might have put a little too much like self-hype into that one. Uh, but yeah, that was that was the last match, that was the last show Vince Russo booked, last pay-per-view he booked at least. Uh, you know, the story goes, you know, he less than two weeks later, while the company, the bulk of the roster were in the UK touring, Vince and Ed Ferreira left the company in the night to sign with WCW. Russo never had a contract as head writer of the World Wrestling Federation. And, you know, especially when they added SmackDown to programming, he felt like he was being overworked, underpaid, underappreciated. So I can understand why Russo did what he did to jump ship from WWF to WCW, but still kind of a, a shady way to go about doing it, kind of like in the cover of night when ever, most people are kind of like out overseas touring uh, for in the UK. This show and the build for the show especially really had Russo's fingerprints all over it, but it was like, this was scatterbrained even for Russo's stuff. Like we had run-ins, we had swerves, we had chaos. Basically they were throwing everything on the wall to see what stuck for this build and for this show. Show. A lot of stuff, I think, just because they wanted to see what would happen. Also, there were some things that were out of their control, like the Undertaker's injury, uh, leading to Bulldog coming in to replace him. So yeah, a lot of crazy stuff here. You know, we got some of the good stuff with Russo as a writer, like every a lot of mid-carders getting storylines, but we also got the bad stuff out of this show as well. I think that's kind of like the yin and the yang of Vince Russo.
Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Unforgiven 99. Thanks once again to Glenn for picking this show out. If you all play a role in determining which shows I review, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review in the future. And next time, we are heading into March, WrestleMania season. The hype is there. It's palpable. You can cut it with a knife, though I don't know why you do that, because wouldn't that electrocute you? Anyway, WrestleMania 10 is next on the docket. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.